pastor did this call and response, God is good, and the people say all the time, and the pastor says all the time, and the people say God is good. But I looked around with different eyes that day, Kirk. I looked from the standpoint of somebody who was in a great deal of pain, uh, have, trying to love my spouse who was in a great deal of pain and who might not live. And I saw it differently. I realize that when people are hurting and suffering, when we use a cliche, we tend to minimize their experience of pain. So ultimately, that's got to be our plumb line. What does God's Word say about this uh, Christian cliche? So um, let's go for the first one. Ready? Okay. <laughs> hey, just have faith. Just have faith. Hey, don't ask questions. Just have faith. What do you think about that one? Well, that's one that I, I put in the book because I realized that a lot of people like to have faith. In my little town of Manitou Springs, Colorado, people are very spiritual. They have faith in a lot of things. A lot of people even who think that they have no faith at all still have faith. They get on an airplane and they have faith in the principles of aerodynamics. They have faith in the airline to have vetted the pilots properly and tested them out to be sure they can safely <laughs> take off and land at their destination. You have faith in all kinds of things every day. The question though is not whether we have faith, but whether the object of our faith is worthy. When you get on an airplane with a trusted airline, you can say, okay, I'm statistically, I'm in pretty good shape of being on this airplane. But when somebody says, just have faith in faith, they're not really saying anything at all. What they're saying is just trust your own emotions. Well, scripture doesn't teach us to trust our own emotions in that way. Yes, emotions are a way of thinking. Emotions are very important. But scripture regularly says, test this and see. The Apostle Paul encountered a group of people called the Bereans. And every time the Apostle Paul, who was probably the greatest, one of the greatest Bible teachers of all time, uh, and, and so much of the New Testament of scripture was written by the Apostle Paul, Every time he, he said, made a statement, the Bereans would look back at Scripture to see if it was so. And Paul commended them for doing this. He didn't condemn them. He didn't just say, have faith and just trust whatever I say. He said, good for you for looking into the Scripture to see if this is really true. That's why I love talking with you, because um, you have also helped me to realize that even the atheist has a tremendous amount of faith. And so having faith, I think, is part of the human experience. At the end of the day, we're trusting in, in certain things and building our entire worldview on it. Um, but I, I actually lost my faith in atheism when I was about 17 years old, when God came down and he opened my eyes and showed me the truth. So uh, now I have biblical faith in Jesus. And, and that's a whole lot more reliable than faith that nobody times nothing equals everything. All right, let's jump into that cli cliche number two. You ready? Okay, I'm ready. Oh, we say this one all the time. Love the sin or hate the sin. This is one I, th I would recommend people set aside. I know that's controversial because it does seem to be a way to focus on loving people in spite of the situation in which they find themselves. But we need to go back and understand what Scripture says about sin. When we stand in a position of judgment and say, somebody else's sin is worse for them than mine is for me, then, then we put ourselves in a precarious position of not understanding what sin really is all about. Sin means departing from God's way. So we, we have to deal with our own sin. There's, just because we go to church doesn't mean that we somehow can stand in a position to look at other people. But Kirk, honestly, this cliche is often used when it comes to issues such as homosexuality or transgenderism, where people are looking at, at sec the, the sexual natures of sin. And one thing we need to keep in mind is that people who embrace alternative lifestyles don't view this as a sin issue. They view it as their identity. If you were to say to me, hey, Jeff, I really like you, but it's sort of freaky that your eyes are brown. You know, you, you know that's sort of weird. I don't like that. Well, I would have to say, that's who I am. That's the way I was born, right? Well, people who are in an alternative lifestyle, that's how they see what they do. 
So how do you get them to the place where they learn to see what is true all throughout Scripture and, and, and that Christians really teach and believe is that our primary identity should be in Jesus Christ, not in our gender, not in our sexuality, not in our intelligence, not in our social class, not in our athleticism or anything else. That's where we want people to, to get to. So saying, I love you, but I hate your sin, is not a great way to introduce a conversation to someone when you're trying to get them to see that their hope ultimately is, ha is having their identity in Jesus Christ. Okay, cliche number three. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. <laughs> what do you think about that one? You know, What's wrong with that? God is good. He is good all the time. Uh, that's right. God is good, and he's always good. And I, I close the book, Unquestioned Answers, with this chapter. And I tell of a story of where uh, my wife, Stephanie, had a blood clot in her brain. And it nearly killed her. This particular kind of blood clot has a 48% mortality rate. And this has happened to her twice. So nearly two times I have, uh, or two, two, two times I have nearly lost her. And there was a particular moment where I was sitting in the, in the hospital room next to Stephanie and she was suffering so badly. She, she was awake for a little bit and she tried to send a text message to a friend who asked how she was doing. And she just, tears rolled down her cheeks and she said, I can't remember how to send a text message. And inside I'm just crying out, God, why are you doing this? Well, around that time, I, I went to church and, you know, the pastor did this call and response. God is good. And the people say all the time. And the pastor says all the time. And the people say God is good. But I looked around with different eyes that day, Kirk. I looked from the standpoint of somebody who was in a great deal of pain, uh, have, trying to love my spouse who was in a great deal of pain and who might not live. And I saw it differently. I realize that when people are hurting and suffering, when we use a cliche, we tend to minimize their experience of pain. We're a lot better off engaging people with questions. If somebody says, I could never believe in a God who would allow difficult things to happen, you know, we're better off saying, hey, wow, I bet that comes out of a really intense story. And if you've got time and if you're willing to share it with me, I would love to hear it. That's so good. And so what I'm, what I'm hearing you say is that there is truth in some of these cliches, but yeah. sometimes it so tries to over, oversimplify some truths. Now, some of it's not always true. Um, what, what are some of the resources available through Summit Ministries that would really help people get specific answers to specific questions? Well, Kirk, and all, with all of these topics, we've tried to address them through a special program we have at Summit Ministries that's a free virtual program called Basecamp. And in the base camp, we will have speakers who address these issues and then take questions from the audience. So there's a live version of it, but then we always take the videos of this and release them in a way that can be used, say, among teachers, Christian teachers, or in your small group course or something like that. And we've addressed issues like critical race theory. We've addressed issues like anxiety, depression, suicide, addiction. We've addressed issues like gender identity in those programs. And that's all free. That's all available at summit.org. And then, in, of course, in those programs, we also recommend a lot of other resources for further study because there are lots of people out there who are grappling with these issues, starting with the realization that every human being is made as an image bearer of God and that he loves us, but recognizing that God created the very idea of good, but that we have fallen into sin, and sin means losing your way, but that through the cross, Jesus Christ has, and through rising again from the dead, Jesus Christ has offered us redemption from our sins, which leads us to a very different kind of life. That's the goal, really. So in other words, I guess if I had to just put it in one simple sentence, hopefully not cliche, I would say that the goal is not to shorten the conversation by giving a trite summary. The goal is to open up a conversation so that we can display the gospel truth with our lives, with our words, and with turning people to scripture. So many people are thinking, I want my kids to go to Summit. <laughs> I want to go to Summit <laughs> as a parent. Yeah. Um, uh, tell us again how people can sign their kids up to go to Summit and uh, get a hold of some of these online resources. Where do they go? 
Well, this is really easy to do, Kirk. If you just go to our website, which is summit.org, S-U-M-M-I-T. For those in the South, it doesn't have two T's. It's but two it's M's and one T. Two M's, one T, summit.org. And you can find out how to sign up for the events that we have for young adults. Now, these are for students aged 16 to 25. So we're looking for students who are in college or who are on their way to college. We want them to come for two weeks, either to our campus in Manitou Springs, Colorado, or on Lookout in Lookout Mountain, Georgia. And in those two programs, you can, you can sign up there, arrange for those two weeks to take place, and then we will take very good care of your children and grandchildren for two weeks. We'll challenge them. We'll bring them into contact with wonderful Christian thought leaders to give them great information, but also answer their questions and care about them personally. It's incredibly life-changing. 